for me to ask commissioners to take their seats so we can start again. The chair would like me to introduce the next topic. Would you like me to start? Uh, if everyone's ready, yes, please. Okay, that takes us to item 10B, which is a briefing on the Fukushima nuclear disaster and radioactivity along the West Coast. Now, we have gotten a number of inquiries on this subject, um, including one by Chair Kinsey. And so I asked uh, Joe Street of your staff to research the topic and provide a report to you. So to my left is Joe. Uh, Joe is a former Sea Grant Fellow with the Coastal Commission, and we're incredibly pleased that he's now working as an environmental scientist uh, with, with the, ocean, the Energy, Ocean Resources, and Federal Consistency Division. Now, if you haven't had a chance to read this report yet, I really encourage you to do so. Joe did just a ma marvelous job wrapping his arms around the science of this subject and then presenting it to a lay audience. So today, Joe's going to give you a, a, a brief presentation on his research and conclusions. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Joe. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. Chair Kinsey, as Allison said, this is a briefing report on the Fukushima disaster and the implications for the California coast. And the, pur the pur purpose of this presentation is pretty basic. It's to provide the commission with staff's research and an assessment of the situation. Um, there's more detailed information in the written report that Allison mentioned. Next slide, please. The basic outline of the initial disaster, well, we're sort of waiting for the slide, but I can continue talking, is probably fairly familiar to you. On March 11th in 2011, a magnitude 9.0 earthquake occurred off the coast of the Tohoku region of northeastern Japan. The earthquake triggered a series of massive tsunamis that struck the coast within 15 minutes of the quake, inundating large areas of the shoreline. And as you can imagine, the combined effects of the earthquake and tsunami were devastating. Next slide, please. Now, the nuclear portion of the accident occurred approximately an hour after the earthquake, after tsunami waves of up, up to 14 meters in height overwhelmed the seawall protecting the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. Much of the plant was flooded, which caused the failure of backup generators that had kicked in and had been powering the plant when the grid failed during the earthquake. Without power, the cooling systems at several of the reactor units failed. The reactors overheated and several explosions and fires occurred. This chain of events led to a large release of radioactive gases and volatile elements to the atmosphere, mostly in the week following the accident. In addition, in several weeks and months that followed, emergency cooling water that had been used to dissipate heat in the damaged reactors was discharged directly to the Pacific Ocean, creating a second pathway for the release of radioactive materials. Next slide, please. Now, most of the radionuclides released to the atmosphere in the week after the accident were deposited by rainfall over Japan and especially the western North Pacific Ocean. The rest was rapidly dispersed and diluted over the northern hemisphere over the, next, the following two to three weeks. The slide here, which I hope you can see the colors of, shows a model simulation of this process. And the colors represent the concentration of radioactive materials. It's important to note that the scale on this slide is logarithmic. So the oranges, yellows, and greens that you see are actually diluted by hundreds or thousands of times from the initial concentrations over Japan. Airborne radioactivity was first detected in California about five days after the accident peaked in late March, and had mostly disappeared by the end of May. Radionuclides that were deposited in rainfall were later detected in low concentrations in food and water in the first few months after the accident. Most of these radionuclides that were present in the atmosphere were short-lived, with half-lives measured in days. This means that the primary exposure of people and ecosystems in California to Fukushima radiation was a short pulse in the spring of 2011. Longer-lived isotopes, particularly cesium, which has two radioactive isotopes of 137 and 134, were present in the fallout and could result in longer-term exposure. However, as I'm going to discuss in a couple of minutes, the radiation exposure in California has been very low relative to pre-existing sources from natural and, and human-caused radiation sources. Next slide, please. 
The second major dispersal, dispersal pathway for radioactive materials from Fukushima is in the slower currents of the North Pacific. The oceanic plume includes both fallout to the North Pacific and direct discharge from the plant. As in the previous figure, this is a model simulation of the dispersal of the radioactive plume in the ocean. The time scale is over a period of 10 years. In the ocean, the main radionuclides of concern are those long-lived cesium isotopes, since they persist long enough to still be present years or even decades after the accident. Again, it's important to emphasize that on this figure, the concentrations are plotted on a log scale, so even the relatively warm colors you can see um, represent a massive dilution from the initial concentrations off the coast of Japan. The spatial patterns and timing shown here we believe are pretty accurate. They're backed up by direct field measurements, which are, of course, are sparser than what you can achieve with a model si simulation. Um, but the field measurements also show that the actual levels of radioactivity in the eastern Pacific along the west coast are up to 10 times lower than the model predictions, probably because the model did not anticipate the amount of mixing into the deep ocean that appears to have occurred. Fukushima-derived cesium reached the coast of North America off British Columbia last summer, but the plume has not yet reached the California coast. You may have seen some headlines last week reporting that no uh, radioactivity from Fukushima had been detected in the latest round of sampling of giant kelp off the California coast. The fact remains, though, that the oceanic plume will probably be detected within the next, few, the next year or two the cesium concentrations will be very low relative to natural sources of oceanic radioactivity. But Fukushima's legacy will be detectable off our coast for many years. Next slide, please. With, it, with this in mind, it's worth mentioning that to date, neither the state nor the federal government has mounted any sort of monitoring campaign for Fukushima radioactivity off the California coast. And that we owe our current knowledge to academic researchers and several citizen science efforts. As a quick aside, I wanted to acknowledge these efforts, which are largely supported by volunteers, individual donors, and small research grants. Next slide, please. The basic message that we've heard from governments since 2011 is that our exposure to Fukushima radiation has been very low and poses little risk to human health or ecosystems. Staff's conclusion, based on the best available science, is that this consensus is essentially correct. Compared to other sources of radiation exposure, both natural and human-caused, Doses from Fukushima in the United States have been very low. Now, this figure in the blue box here shows several maximum estimates of annual doses from Fukushima from different sources in California. I should point out again that this chart has a log scale, meaning that the Fukushima doses in California are actually thousands of, thousands of times lower than what we're already receiving on a yearly basis from both natural and other anthropogenic sources. Um, and they're also tens of thousands of times lower than the lowest dose that has been linked to any uptick in cancer rates, which is shown in red on this figure. This is not to say that the exposure to radiation from Fukushima is benign, but rather that the con contribution to our cumulative dose is fairly small, at most roughly equivalent to a few extra, a few extra dental x-rays. Next slide, please. As a final note to put the Fukushima event in perspective, I wanted to show you this slide, which compares the cesium-137, which is the longest lived isotope um, that's being detected in the oceans in any con high, con well, I shouldn't say high, but any measurable concentration. Um, this compares the amount reaching the ocean due to the accident with other natural and anthropogenic sources of radioactivity. Fukushima is shown here by two relatively small ovals, representing both the direct discharge and the fallout contributions. Um, together, they, at, at the highest estimates, they're about equivalent to the contribution from the Chernobyl disaster in 1986. But Fukushima's contribution is much smaller than that from nuclear weapons testing in the 50s and 60s, and is dwarfed by the large reservoir of radioactivity from naturally occurring elements, such as potassium-40 and uranium-238. All this being said, I think there's a second perspective that can be drawn from this diagram, and that is that the Fukushima disaster is just the latest example of a human action or activity which has injected a pulse of artificial radioactivity into the ocean. A figure like this shows that each pulse, such as the weapons testing, Chernobyl, Fukushima, has been relatively small relative to the natural background, 
but it also obscures the cost in terms of human suffering and environmental damage that these actions and accidents have caused on local and regional scales, in this case in Japan. I wanted to point this out lest we start feeling too sanguine about the outcome of the Fukushima disaster and other instances where radiation has leaked into the environment. So with that said, I will conclude staff's presentation and I'm happy to address any questions. Thank you. Uh, at this point in time, uh, we are going to report out from closed session. I'll ask Hope Schmelzer, our counsel, to make the report. Thank you, Chair. Um, in closed session, the California Coastal Commission received litigation information and advice in a matter of threatened litigation and gave direction to, to staff. Thank you. Thank you. And this completes the uh, May meeting of the California Coastal Commission.